Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. So in this video, I want to talk briefly about the electromagnetic spectrum and give a broad overview about the different types of electromagnetic waves. In the previous video, I talked about this relationship between the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave and its period, which can also be expressed in terms of the wavelength and the frequency, which, and we talked about, this is a spatial property of how the wave, basically how far two different regions where the electric field points up are. And this thing is how fast the wave oscillates at any given location. And the product of those two numbers, lambda times f, is equal to the number c. Now, we're gonna talk today about a variety of different types of electromagnetic waves that have basically different values of lambda and f. They all obey the property that the product equals c, however. And these include things like radio waves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays. And the thing that this uh, video is meant to give you a sense of is how having different wavelengths and frequencies affects how these different types of radiation interact with matter. Radio waves and x-rays do very different things to materials, and that's largely due to their different frequencies. Now, before we get into that, we should uh, spend a little bit of time thinking about what this means. Remember, all an electromagnetic wave is, is a disturbance in the electric and magnetic field that has periodic oscillations in both space and time. But to generate these things, you need an oscillating charge. So to produce an electric field that goes up and down, you need to take a charge and yank it up and down. That creates electromagnetic oscillation that is the seed for an electromagnetic wave. And the frequency with which you yank this thing up and down is what sets the frequency of the oscillation for the electromagnetic wave. If you shake this charge up and down slowly, you get a low frequency. If you shake it quickly, you get a high frequency. And of course, since frequency and wavelength are related, that means that has implications for the wavelength. So the way you move charges basically sets what the frequency of the electromagnetic wave is. But the thing also you need to understand is that this electromagnetic wave can not only be generated by moving charges, it can induce the motion of charges. It can cause charges to oscillate back and forth. Imagine we have one of these oscillating electromagnetic waves where the electric field points up sometimes and down others. This thing travels through space. These regions of high, of upward pointing electric field and downward pointing electric fields move through space. When those interact with a positive charge, when the positive elect, when the upward electric field is there, it yanks the positive charge up. When this downward going electric field gets over here, it'll pull the charge down. So when one of these electromagnetic waves passes by a charge, it will cause it to oscillate up and down. And again, it'll oscillate up and down at the same frequency as the electromagnetic wave has. So if you take a charge here and yank it up and down at a particular frequency, that will cause other charges, if they interact with this wave, to move up and down at the same frequency. Now, this all works in a classical sense. Things, the one caveat I should say is that if you start talking about higher frequencies, the world of quantum mechanics begins to creep in. But for relatively slowly moving charges, this is a reasonable picture. And still, it's also true that in some sense, the frequency of the oscillation or the, is the same for the charge that's moving, the thing that's being produced, the electromagnetic wave that's being produced, and the receiving charge. So this is why there's a direct connection between frequency, wavelength, and how these charges, how electromagnetic waves interact with matter. Matter is these charges, they're gonna oscillate at a frequency that depends on both the frequency and the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave, okay? So 
Now, at this point, I do want to use this as a opportunity to clarify a couple conceptual questions that I want to make sure you understand about this relationship. There are also going to be a couple problems that I'll ask you to use this to calculate the wavelength given a frequency and a frequency given a wavelength. Those, you know, may be covered in a future video, but what I want you to do is also just have a very good sense of what this relationship implies about electromagnetic fields with long wavelengths or short frequencies or vice versa. So a good conceptual question about this sort of relationship is which electromagnetic wave has the longest wavelength? One with a frequency of one hertz, one with a frequency of one kilohertz, which is a thousand hertz, one with a frequency of one megahertz, which is a million hertz, or one with a frequency of one gigahertz, or a billion hertz. Which of these has the longest wavelength? And yes, you could use this formula to calculate what the wavelength is for all four and do that. If that makes you comfortable, feel free. But what I want you to do, if you can, is figure out what's the trend. One of these has the longest wavelength, one has the shortest. Which do you think it is? The answer is A, the one with one hertz. The reason is, if the frequency gets small, remember, lambda times F has to be a constant C, the speed of light. If F is small, Lambda has to be big to counteract that. So if you have a low frequency, say one hertz, the wavelength has to be big. Similarly, this thing, which has a very high frequency, must have a short wavelength. So understanding this relationship allows you to figure out which of these has the longest wavelength and also which one has the shortest wavelength without having to solve each of these independently, which is handy. A similar question, which electromagnetic wave has the highest frequency? We have one with a wavelength of one meter, one with a wavelength of a millimeter, one with a wavelength of one micrometer, which is one one millionth of a meter, or one with a wavelength of one nanometer. Which of these has the highest frequency? The answer to that is D. Again, it's the same logic. If we want F to be big, we want lambda to be small. The smallest wavelength is one nanometer, so the highest frequency must correspond to this wavelength. Similarly, this one with the longest wavelength must have the smallest frequency. This is a basic sort of relationship that I would hope you'd be able to understand by the end of this course. So, and I understand it can sometimes be a little counterintuitive because naturally people want to say if something is more in one property, it's more in another, but that's not the case. here. Okay. So things with higher frequencies tend to have smaller wavelengths. And this is the basis of why all plots of the electromagnetic spectrum usually show both of these properties. This is the version you have from your OpenStax textbook. This is a plot showing the different types of electromagnetic waves. Down on the bottom, we have the frequency. Up at the top, we have the wavelength. And these are logarithmic plots with many orders of magnitude. So here we start at one hertz, a hundred hertz, 10,000 hertz, a million hertz, et cetera, et cetera. This is covering 24 orders of magnitude. But now notice here, here we have a small frequency, one hertz, to 10 to the 24 hertz. So frequency increases from this side to this side. On the top, we have 300 meters, three times 10 to the six meters, so like 3,000 kilometers, three centimeters, three microns, 
three angstroms, three fermis, which is a small fraction of a meter, or 30 fermis. So wavelength is long over here and short over here, while frequency is small over here and big over here. That's, again, that basic relationship. And on this are marked the locations of things like radio waves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays, which are the basic different types of electromagnetic waves, which are also called electromagnetic radiation. That's a generic term. It doesn't mean like nuclear radiation. It's just another word for stuff that can move through space. Just to say, everything gets fuzzy at all of these boundaries. Radio waves to infrared, they overlap. Ultraviolet to x-rays, they overlap. I'm not going to be a stickler on knowing where the boundaries are, but I want you to know the sequence because it's important. I want you to know that as you go to smaller wavelength or increasing frequency, you go from radio to infrared to visible to ultraviolet to x-rays to gamma rays. That is important. That will be on the test. Okay? So, now I just want to talk briefly about each of these different types of radiation or electromagnetic waves. And we'll start with radio and work our way up to x-rays and gamma rays. Radio are the classic example of electromagnetic waves. They're the easiest ones to demonstrate. They have frequencies ranging from one hertz to one gigahertz. These are frequencies we can get our brains around. One hertz is something you could imagine grabbing a positive charge and actually physically shaking it back and forth. You know, kilohertz, gigahertz, that's faster. But when you considered things like circuits involving capacitors and inductors, you could find that the charges and currents oscillated in those circuits at frequencies like that. Now, the wavelengths of these things are kind of ridiculous. They can range from, for a one hertz thing, for a one hertz wave, we're talking about a wavelength that's in millions of meters or hundreds of thousands of kilometers. It's very long. Gigahertz, we're talking about centimeters. So, you know, the length of your hand. These are the sorts of electromagnetic waves you can set up easily in a lab. It just takes circuit elements, capacitors, and inductors. So these are relatively easy to demo. The, and this also has implications for how they interact with matter. This is stuff that is trying to slosh the charges back and forth relatively slowly. This turns out to not have a, be able to often have a big effect on most normal matter, like you or me, which is made up of atoms. And those atoms hold their charges, their positive and negative charges together well enough that they don't tend to respond to this relative gentle electromagnetic field. The things that respond most strongly to these sorts of electromagnetic fields or electromagnetic waves are things where charges and currents can move easily where there's little resistance, namely metals. This is why when you look at radio antennas like the cell phone antenna, they're almost entirely made out of various chunks of metal. Met metal circuits are the ones that both produce and react to these sorts of electromagnetic waves the best. Okay, so that's radio waves. If we go to, again, larger frequencies and smaller wavelengths, we enter the realm of what's called infrared radiation. It's called, and here we're talking about frequencies that range from 10 gigahertz, roughly, to about 100 terahertz. So this is a trillion hertz. We're quickly running out of the space where these sorts of numbers are going to be easy to think about. These correspond to wavelengths between about three centimeters and three micrometers. Now, these frequencies are hard to imagine creating with a circuit, 
some people can. It's actually pushing the state of the art of the technology. But these are actually the natural frequencies that correspond to the random thermal motions of atoms and molecules in objects we see today. You know, we see around us all the time. If they're really cold, they tend to oscillate at low frequencies. If they're relatively hot, they oscillate at higher frequencies. This is why infrared radiation is associated with heat. Things that are warm emit more of, more of this at higher frequencies. And this is why you have infrared cameras that show this. For example, this is one of the classic pictures from NASA. There's a person here in normal visible light. This is what they look like in the infrared. The person is emitting light because they're warm and they are producing this sort of radiation. Now the thing is, people are made out of atoms and molecules, which are neutral things. How do they produce an electromagnetic wave, which requires charges to move? Well, the thing to realize is, you know, molecules in our body do have some amount of charge. You know, there are ions existing inside our chemistry. But in addition to that, most molecules are what are called polarized. That is, the positive charges are displaced from the negative charges to some amount. And that means as you move these atoms and molecules around, you do produce oscillations in the electric and magnetic field that can seed electromagnetic waves. And again, most things in our current environment, just by the fact that there are a bunch of molecules moving around, will produce infrared radiation in this wavelength range. Now, as we go to even shorter frequency, even shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies, we enter the realm of visible light. This is the stuff we actually see. And just to say, this is why it's called infrared. Visible light, the stuff we can see, has wavelengths between about 300 nanometers and 800 nanometers. And that corresponds to frequencies between about 400 and 800 terahertz. Again, we don't usually think about that. The shorter wavelengths correspond to what we see as blue and violet light. The longer wavelengths correspond to reddish and orange light. Infrared is longer wavelength than red, so lower frequency than red. The thing we're going to talk about next, which is ultraviolet, is shorter wavelength, higher frequency than violet. Now, you can make radiation like this from just thermal motions of materials. The sun does this. The sun glows at these wavelengths due to its thermal mo due to the thermal motions of all of the things here. But now it's really hot. It's no longer like a solid or a liquid or a gas. It's a plasma. So to generate things, you now need fairly high temperatures and fairly violent motions. But of course, we also know because things have color that these wavelengths can also interact with atoms. The important thing to understand is 300 nanometers to 800 nanometers, we're now getting to the scale of individual atoms. The way that visible light interacts with matter is now it's going to interact with atoms with matter on the atomic scale. Absorbing and emitting light is now corresponding to changes in the configuration of electrons around individual atoms. So the way that actually happens often involves the wonderful world of quantum mechanics. And this is going to become more and more of an issue as we go further. If we go further, now to the ultraviolet, we're now talking about wavelengths between 300 nanometers and about 10 nanometers. So now we're going from about 1,000 terahertz up to 10 to the 15 hertz, which this is like 30 petahertz. This, now again, to do this, you need to make those charges move very, very quickly back and forth. This corresponds to really high temperatures. So the sun produces some amount of ultraviolet light. That 
is again, because it's really hot, things like arc welders produce that sort of light. That's why you're supposed to wear glasses. The reason that at this point we need to start taking safety precautions is that at these high frequencies, you are shaking the atoms so much that, or shaking the charges back and forth so quickly that you can actually ionize atoms and break chemical bonds. This means if you are, this sort of radiation gets incident upon you, it can change chemistry, it can damage cells. This is why ultraviolet light is hazardous. You know, it interacts with the upper layers of our atmosphere and is mostly blocked, but if you're exposed to it, it can do chemistry, which you guys are probably more expert in than I am. Going even further, we get more extreme things, x-rays and gamma rays. These have even shorter wavelengths, less than 10 nanometers and very high frequencies. To produce these, what you need to do is actually smash charged particles into each other at high speeds. The way people at least used to make x-rays is you basically made a bunch of electrons and used a very high voltage difference to crash them into targets where Basically, these charged particles crashing into the charged particles of the atoms here produced very fast moving charges, very fast oscillating charges that would produce X rays. To produce gamma rays, which are even shorter wavelength, even higher frequency, that requires usually nuclear reactions. You know, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, nuclear decay, that can produce this. Generating these sorts of waves requires very extreme events. And these sorts of things now start interacting with atoms in a different way than the previous ones. The thing is, at this point, the wavelengths are so short that they're getting small compared to atoms. So they're no longer when you look at an atom, it's no longer like one thing with some positive charges and some negative charges in it. It's a nucleus surrounded by electrons. So how they interact with material now involves usually interactions with individual subatomic particles. These things tend to interact more with nuclei than with an atom as a whole. And as you know, the nucleus is only a small part of the atom. So this is part of the reason that they can penetrate so well, why we use x-rays to look through people. They are still interact a bit, but they will pass through more material before they interact. Even so, these are still very fast frequencies. And so when they hit a nucleus or an electron, they will jitter it back and forth very quickly and can still basically ionize atoms, break molecules. So these are again, things that can cause chemistry and thus have health effects. You know, they're great for diagnostic imaging, but they have those risks. So, and this is why it's important to understand this, that these wavelengths and frequencies have important implications for how these waves, for how these different types of electromagnetic waves, which are all oscillations in electric and magnetic fields, why they have such a range of interactions with matter. So that's the electromagnetic spectrum. What we're going to do in the next concept video is talk a little bit more about the properties of these electromagnetic waves and how they can transport energy. Thank you all for your time.